We'll invite you to grab your pew Bible from in front of you if you would like to, or if you brought a Bible with you, you may open that. Hopefully, if you're at home, you have a Bible at hand that you can go ahead and flip to and flip open. We're in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, and we'll be reading verses 23 through 28. It's the very last uh, few verses of Mark, chapter 2. Hear the word of the Lord. One Sabbath, Jesus and the disciples was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. And, he, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed this morning. Well, today we are continuing our new sermon series. We just started last week, a series we're calling Reset, Back to the Basics of Following Jesus. As we uh, talked about occasionally over time, we may find that our computers, our phones, the technological devices that we have uh, just start acting weird. They start developing problems. And so maybe you'll turn your phone all the way off and turn it back on to try to fix it. And sometimes that takes care of it. But sometimes things get gunked up even more than that. And in order to fix it, we have to erase everything on the phone and start all over again in order to get things working right. Sometimes, I think we find that the same thing is true with our understanding of what it means to be the church, what it means to be a Christian. Where we've had indications for the past several decades that this might be a case, that we need kind of a, a spiritual reset, the experiences with the pandemic and social upheaval over the past year has brought those changes to the forefront and pushed them into overdrive. We need to reset and get ourselves back to the basics of following Jesus. To that end, we're spending our time in this series working our way through the Gospel of Mark. Last week, as we looked at Jesus' baptism, we saw that we are called to repentance in order to be empowered by the Spirit who sends us out to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. Well, as we talked about in looking at the opening uh, few verses of Mark's Gospel last week, Mark hits the ground running in his gospel from the very beginning. It is the shortest of the gospels and its pace, frankly, is almost relentless. It makes for a fun read because of that, but that can also lead us to miss some of the details that Mark slips in, particularly when he actually pauses the action. This morning's passage is something of one of those pauses. As Mark slows down the action in our passage this morning, we are reminded of our need to slow down as well. As we look at our story this morning, we will see that when we accept the gift that the Lord of the Sabbath has given, we're able to find a rest that enables us to recenter, renew, and recharge. As we get ready to dig into God's word this morning, would you please take a moment to pray with me? Lord God, we do come before you, tired, yearning for a true rest and wondering where and how we might ever find it. We try to find ways to rest, Lord, but somehow, so often, those measures seem to leave us wanting more. They just come up short. And yet you have provided a true rest for us. So, Lord, as we come to your word, would your spirit open our hearts, our eyes, our ears, and our minds for the truth that you have for us? As we look at the story of Jesus walking through a field of grain, would we See and hear Jesus walking through our hearts and our souls, inviting us 
to a rest that only he can provide. Thank you, Lord, for your word and for your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, I'd like to do something a little bit risky this morning, I suppose. I'd like to uh, open with a question for you. Now, don't worry. It's a rhetorical question, so you don't have to answer out loud unless you're really, really wanting to. Okay? That's all right. Are you ready? Here's the question. How are you doing? How are you doing? Now, I don't mean that in the, in the casual way that we often greet each other. Um, hey, John, how you doing? To which we all know there's really only one acceptable answer, which is followed by, how are you? Right? To which the only response that you can give is, I'm doing fine, too. Great to see you. Right? That's all that we're allowed, really, to do with that. Um, what, I, what I actually mean here is in the deeper sense of actually asking, no, seriously, how are you doing really? 2020 was a brutal year, guys, and it took its toll on all of us. And 2021, wow, we're only 17 days into 2021, and we've already shattered records for infections and deaths from the coronavirus. We've had an insurrection and a riot, and our president has been impeached for the second time in just over a year. 17 days. What is going on? This is just relentless. There were a few weeks, I think, um, last year, shortly after everything shut down the first time, where most of us were grateful for the opportunity that the shutdown provided for rest. And a lot of us were finally able to, at least briefly, rest to do that very thing. But nature abhors a vacuum, and frankly, so does our lives. It didn't take long for us to fill that vacuum. If our schedules didn't fill up the space, well, our anxiety and our fear did. If there is an ongoing defining trait of our lives in the 21st century, it is the relentless pace of them. A relentless pace that, frankly, even a global pandemic hasn't really been able to slow down. More often than not, our lives are a frenetic race from one task to another, from one job to the next, an endless parade of chores, responsibilities, and to-do lists. Our minds and our bodies are struggling to maintain themselves in the midst of the stress. And if there's one thing that I hear folks yearning for, it's rest. I just want to rest. Our bodies and our minds need it. But what about rest for our souls? Somewhat similar to the pace of our lives, Mark's gospel carries an urgency to it as well. If you look over the first uh, chapter and uh, first two chapters of the gospel, you'll see what I mean. Immediately, we're told the spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness. And then immediately, Jesus calls Simon and Andrew, who immediately follow him, along with James and John, who immediately drop their nets to do so as well. Then they go to Capernaum and immediately enter the synagogue and immediately encounter a man with an unclean spirit. And then after casting the spirit out they immediately go to Simon's house and then the whole town comes out seeking healing and then a leper comes up to Jesus and then some men dig a hole in the roof of a house for their paralytic friend to be able to see him and then he calls Levi to follow him the pace of the story is relentless it just keeps going and going and going and right in the middle of it there's a pause in Mark 1.35, we read, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place where he prayed. This moment of rest in the opening chapter of the Gospel of Mark lasts for all of one verse. 
And then the action picks up and takes off once again, almost leaving us breathless. But this verse slipped in so quickly is very, very important. Don't let the pace of the story carry you past it. Even Jesus, the Messiah himself, God in the flesh, needed rest. He needed to stop and take time to nourish not just his mind and body, but even more importantly, his soul. If God incarnate needed to take time to rest his body, mind, and soul, how much more do we? As I said, the story in Mark 136 picks up the relentless pace once again, marching steadily forward right up until the point we get to our reading this morning, where we have yet another pause in the action. Rather than just hurrying or rushing from one village, one city to the next, here in this, there's this sense that Jesus and the disciples are just kind of casually strolling almost through a field of wheat. And as they go along, they're just plucking heads of wheat to ease their hunger. Now, what's interesting about what they're doing is this is allowed in the Old Testament law. In Deuteronomy 23:25, there is a specific provision given to those who are traveling along their way, and they're allowed to pluck heads of grain with their fingers as a snack to help sustain them. Because remember back then, they didn't travel by car, right? They walked everywhere. And so they needed the sustenance. Now, they couldn't use a tool to harvest that wheat, but they could just pluck what they needed as they went along. And whoever's wheat it was needed to allow them to do that. But the Pharisees, which were watching Jesus, had a problem with this. Now, if you're paying attention to the story so far, and I know we've skipped a big chunk of it, this is the fourth time in the second chapter alone that Jesus and the Pharisees have clashed with each other. So at, by this point in time, the Pharisees are starting to look for problems with Jesus and his disciples, and they found one. They interpreted what they were doing as harvesting, which is work. And the Old Testament is very clear. You are not allowed to work on the Sabbath. And so they called Jesus and his disciples out for it. Now, what's interesting is Jesus's response is as fascinating as it might be somewhat confusing to us. N.T. Wright explains this well. Jesus's reply is a bit of a tease, but it packs a strong punch. He doesn't deny that the disciples are out of line with traditional Sabbath observance, but he pleads special circumstances and scriptural precedent. He puts himself on par with King David in the period when David, who has already been anointed by Samuel but not yet enthroned because Saul was still king, was on the run, gathering support, waiting for his time to come. That's a pretty heavy claim. The implication is that Jesus is the true king, marked out by God, presumably in his baptism, but not yet recognized and enthroned. He, therefore, has the right, when he and his people are hungry, to bypass the normal regulations. In other words, this kind of Sabbath breaking, so far from being an act of casual or wanton civil disobedience, is a deliberate sign like the refusal to fast. A sign that the king is here, that the kingdom of God is breaking in. That instead of waiting for the old creation to come to its point of rest, the new creation is already bursting upon the old world. Jesus drives this point home by saying the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. It's really hard, I think, for us today to understand just how important the Sabbath was to the Hebrews back in Jesus' day and, frankly, how important the Sabbath is to or ought to be to us today. We've talked before about how the Sabbath is a creation ordinance, something that, that God instituted from the very beginning, as, as was pointed out in the children's message from Genesis 2. It's something God instituted in the Ten Commandments as well. 
which really ought to drive home for us just how important keeping the Sabbath ought to be. In fact, it was so important to the Hebrews of Jesus' day that they went so far as to define work down to the number of steps that you were allowed to take each day. How many of you count steps every day with these marvelous little trackers that annoy you to death if you don't get up and move, right? Aren't they great? Good. Something else that I need to feel guilty about. And this time it's hourly. <laughs> it's great, right? Well, it's okay on the Sabbath. It needs to shut up because if you take more than like a hundred steps, you've started working. And many of you are like, sweet. I don't like to take a hundred steps any day. I know the feeling. But that's how important it was. It was so important to our Puritan forefathers that wrote the Westminster Confession and Catechisms that, frankly, they put severe restrictions on what we're allowed to do in the Westminster Confession about the Sabbath. It almost seems as if the Sabbath was created as yet one more burden that we have to bear. And as a result of us, for, for most of us today, other than being a day we go to church, the Sabbath probably doesn't mean all that much to us. In fact, more and more often, many of us, frankly, aren't even taking the time to come to church on Sundays anyway. The, the only thing that we really do to mark the Sabbath, when work or sports or sleeping in gets in the way, okay, that's all right. It's not that big of a deal. The rule of the Sabbath, frankly, has become for many more important than the reason for it. And when we forget the reason for why something matters, well, eventually we're going to stop following the rule as well. But Jesus said in our reading this morning that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. We were, weren't meant to follow a rule strictly for the rule's sake. The rule is there for a reason. Because the Sabbath was given to us as a gift, an invitation, an opportunity to do something absolutely essential to our being, absolutely necessary for our humanity. But something we'll forget to do if we aren't reminded to do it. The Sabbath was given us for the same reason that God took it in Genesis 2, for rest, true rest. Rest not just of the body and the mind, but rest for our souls. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Watch how I do it, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In his confessions, Augustine said that our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. I don't know about you, but over the past year, I have found my heart to be very restless, disturbed, troubled, anxious. And can we be honest? Watching the news really doesn't make anything better. And spending hours upon hours scrolling endlessly through our news feeds really doesn't help a whole lot either. In fact, doing both of those things just seems to make our anxiety worse. Our souls need to rest. A rest that can only be found in the arms of the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus Christ. So just what does being intentional in, this, in observing the Sabbath do for us? Why should we make this a priority? Well, this morning's affirmation of faith, taken from the Westminster Larger Catechism, question 120, outlines the reasons for this for us. In short, being intentional in observing the Sabbath allows us to recenter, renew, and recharge. Following the Sabbath each week, provides us with an opportunity to recenter. The uh, catechism states that God allows us six days out of every seven for our own affairs and reserves only one for himself in these words. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. 
God also insists that this day belongs to him. The seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Here's what happens, guys. Over the course of the week, the weights of this world, the concerns of this life, gradually wear on us and take our eyes off the Lord. Maybe not completely, and some weeks more or less than others, but always to some extent. It's always a distraction. Observing the Sabbath each week provides that regular weekly opportunity to recenter our focus on Jesus Christ, to make sure that he is the center of our lives and all that we're doing. The second reason the catechism gives for observing the Sabbath is an opportunity for us to renew. It continues, and there is the example of God himself, who in six days made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. There are a fascinatingly incredible number of things that the body does when we go to sleep each night. Sleep allows the body and the brain to slow down and engage in the processes of recovery, uh, repairing muscle, healing organs, renewing cells. Uh, chemicals that strengthen the immune system are released into our bodies to help us stay healthy and countless other things. It's amazing what happens. And that's why getting a good night's sleep is so important. Just as our bodies are renewed in sleep, so are our souls when we observe the Sabbath. And the truth is that the strain of everything that is going on in our lives and culture is wearing on our souls. Have you felt that? Have you felt that dis-ease inside? I'm sure we all have at some point or another. When we celebrate the Sabbath, when we're intentional allowing that rest for our soul, that provides the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to renew our soul, to heal it and restore us. So we observe the Sabbath, which allows us to recenter on the Lord and renew our souls. The third reason the catechism gives for observing the Sabbath is the chance to recharge. It concludes, finally, God put a blessing on that day, not just making it a holy day for serving him, but also by establishing that our keeping the Sabbath holy will be a blessing to us as well. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. By observing the Sabbath, we place ourselves in the path of the blessings of the Lord, much like standing in the middle of a river places you in the path of the stream that flows around you. And that allows our souls to recharge for the week that's yet to come before us. Maybe as we've been talking about this, you've felt something stirring in your soul. Kind of like being given a cool glass of water on a hot day makes you realize just how dehydrated you've gotten. And after drinking that first glass, you're like, wow, I need more of that. Maybe you're having a similar reaction inside as well, realizing something in your soul is whispering that this, this might actually be something worth pursuing, something that you ought to do, but you're not quite sure how to do so, how to go about it. Well, first, I want to remind you what Jesus said. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. We've so easily, so quickly, far too easily fall into following the rules for the rules sake, because rules are so easy. So here are some principles that I want to give you to, to point you in a helpful direction. How this actually looks and works and plays out in your life, you're gonna to have to work and figure that out in prayer and with the guidance of the Holy Spirit yourself. But here's some things that you can use to try to point you in the direction of taking a Sabbath rest. First thing is to do that very thing. It's a Sabbath day. So choose a particular day that you are going to sit, that you are going to celebrate the Sabbath each week, the same day. Pick a day. Now, it doesn't have to be Sunday. It can be any day of the week. But I got to be honest, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and praying about it for myself, but also because it's my job. And even as our culture respects and protects Sundays less and less, 
which really, let's be honest, it really doesn't do at all anymore. Sunday's still the best day. It doesn't have to be the day that you pick. I just don't know that there's actually a better one for us to pick. But pick a day and stick to it. Protect that day. Schedule it out. Block it out in your calendar each week. Resting our souls, just like keeping our bodies and our minds healthy, takes intentional decisions and discipline. It doesn't happen accidentally. Just like our physical bodies need a regular schedule of sleep and work, so does our souls. Once you've picked the day, what should the day look like? Well, come to worship services. That's one of the reasons why Sunday is still the best day, because almost all churches still have their services on Sunday. But a lot of churches have added services on Saturdays and at other times. And one of the great things with being online for worship is you don't have to worship with us on Sunday morning. You can join this service any day during the week. And if you happen to be doing that, we are so glad that you have joined us for worship, whatever day of the week it happens to be that you are here. But the important thing is to remember, whatever day you, you have chosen, is to give the whole day to, the, to God. Remember, God has given you six days to take care of everything that you have to do, to work, to do chores, to pay the bills, whatever it happens to be. And all he's asking for is one, just one. So, come to worship and worship with him. In addition to worship services at church, spend some time in family worship with your spouse, with your children, with your pets, whoever is in your house with you. Spend some time teaching scripture, reading the Bible together, going through the catechism. Westminster Shorter Catechism was actually designed for family worship together. Sing songs, praise songs together. You can find great videos on YouTube to help lead you in the singing of those songs. But it actually isn't just about these more spiritual activities, which are very important, but it's not just about that. Give yourself permission to take a nap. I'm giving you permission to take a nap. I don't know if I have to give you permission to take a nap on Sundays. I think most of you do anyway. But now your pastor's giving you permission to take a nap. Go for a walk. Throw a Frisbee with a friend. Get outside. Get some exercise. Go swimming. Toss a ball. Heck, watch a football game if that's what you would like to do. But don't. the, the important part is to keep your focus on the Lord in whatever you're doing. So don't go so far with those things that you lose sight of the Lord. Because remember, this is the Sabbath day. It's the Lord's day. And finally, look for opportunities to engage in mission and in ministry to others. Visit the sick. Help a poor family. Share the gospel with those in need. Practice hospitality. Go over to your neighbors and have a chat on the front porch with your mask on from six feet away. But go say hi. See how they're doing. Write a letter to someone. A letter to edify them just to encourage them, not just to share news. And particularly in this day and age, make it a letter, not an email, not a text message. Nobody gets mail anymore. And yet, I don't know about you guys, but I still get a little excited when I go, I wonder what's going to be in the mailbox. And every day it's bills. Bills and offers to extend my car's warranty, which isn't exciting mail. Every once in a while, a letter pops up, and I love it. It's so encouraging. Send a letter to somebody. Just as my body rests better when I exercise, our souls also rest better when we exercise our souls by intentionally ministering to others. So make that a part of your Sabbath worship as well. If we are more attentive to caring for our souls by committing to observing the Sabbath, I think we will find that we get the rest that our souls crave. Through that rest, when we're asked, how are you doing, really? We'll be able to give a more genuine answer that we are truly doing well. Wouldn't it be nice when somebody says, how are you doing? To be able to go, you know what? 
I'm actually doing really well. And I bet they'll be really confused. How? How can you be doing well with all that's going on? Because God is good. And how often is God good? God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. You guys are such good Episcopalians. That was great. Except we're Presbyterian, but you know. Brothers and sisters, may God bless you as you accept the gift that the Lord of the Sabbath has given and find a rest that enables us to recenter, renew, and recharge. Amen. Would you please take a moment and pray with me? Lord God, thank you for caring for us as much as you do. We confess, Lord, that we do and have often turned the Sabbath into yet one more obligation, one more rule to follow, one more weight to bear. It's become something, Lord, that frankly makes us feel guilty and weighs us down rather than something that brings us joy and lightens our loads. Lord, I pray that your spirit would plant, plant a seed of yearning in our souls for the rest that the Sabbath was intended to give to us, that we would see it as something to look forward to and delight in and enjoy. Lord, as we celebrate the Sabbath today and in the weeks to come, would we see Jesus standing in the fields of wheat, holding out some kernels to us for us to enjoy with him? And may we find the rest for our souls that we crave in his arms. Thank you, God. For your son, the Lord of the Sabbath, who has given a gift to us that often we fail to really and fully appreciate. It is in his name we pray. Amen.